Readings from the Liturgical Year by Dom Prosper Garange. December 6th, St. Nicholas, Bishop and Confessor. Divine wisdom has willed that on the way which leads to the Messiah, our great high priest, there should be many pontiffs and bishops to pay him the honor due to him. Two popes, St. Melchiades and St. Damascus, two holy doctors, St. Peter Chrysologus and St. Ambrose, two bishops, St. Nicholas and St. Eusebius. These are the glorious pontiffs who have been entrusted with the charge of preparing by their prayers the way of the Christian people towards him who is their sovereign priest according to the order of Melchizedek. As each of their feasts comes, we will show their right to have been thus admitted into the court of Jesus. Today the church celebrates with joy the feast of the great Thaumaturgus Nicholas, who is to the Greek church what St. Martin is to us. The Church of Rome has honored the name of Nicholas for nearly a thousand years. Let us admire the wonderful power which God gave him over creation. But let us offer him our most fervent congratulations in that he was permitted to be one of the 318 bishops who proclaimed at Nicaea that the Word is consubstantial to the Father. The humiliations of the Son of God did not scandalize him, Neither the lowliness of the flesh, which the Sovereign Lord of all things assumed to himself in the womb of the Virgin, nor the poverty of the crib, hindered him from confessing to be the Son of God, equal to God, him who is the Son of Mary. And for this reason God has glorified this his servant, and given him the power to obtain each year, for the children of the Church, the grace of receiving the same Jesus, the Word, with simple faith and fervent love. Let us now listen to the eulogy of St. Nicholas, which the Roman Church has inserted into her liturgy. Nicholas was born in the celebrated city of Patara, in the province of Lycia. His birth was the fruit of his parents' prayers. Evidences of his great future holiness were given from his very cradle. For when he was an infant, he would only take his food once on Wednesdays and Fridays, and then not till evening while on other days he frequently took the breast. He kept up this custom of fasting during the rest of his life. Having lost his parents when he was a boy, he gave all his goods to the poor. Of his Christian kind-heartedness there is the following noble example. One of his fellow citizens had three daughters, but being too poor to obtain them an honorable marriage, he was minded to abandon them to a life of prostitution. Nicholas, having got to know the case, went to the house during the night, and threw in by the window a sum of money sufficient for the dowry of one of the daughters. He did the same a second and a third time, and thus the three were married to respectable men. Having given himself wholly to the service of God, he set out for Palestine that he might visit and venerate the holy places. During this pilgrimage which he made by sea, He foretold to the mariners on embarking, though the heavens were then serene and the sea tranquil, that they would be overtaken by a frightful storm. In a very short time the storm arose. All were in the most imminent danger when he quelled it by his prayers. His pilgrimage ended, he returned home, giving to all men example of the greatest sanctity. He went, by an inspiration from God, to Myra, the metropolis of Lycia, which had just lost its bishop by death, and the bishops of the province had come together for the purpose of electing a successor. While they were holding counsel for the election, they were told by a revelation from heaven that they should choose him who, on the morrow, should be first to enter the church, his name being Nicholas. Accordingly, the requisite observations were made when they found Nicholas to be waiting at the church door. They took him, and to the incredible delight of all, made him the bishop of Myra. During his episcopate, he never flagged in the virtues looked for in a bishop. Chastity, which indeed he had always preserved, gravity, assiduity in prayer, watchings, abstinence, generosity and hospitality, meekness in exhortations, severity in reproving. He befriended widows and orphans by money, by advice, and by every service in his power. So zealous a defender was he of all who suffered oppression, 
that on one occasion, three tribunes, having been condemned by the Emperor Constantine, who had been deceived by calumny, and having heard of the miracles wrought by Nicholas, they recommended themselves to his prayers, though he was living at a very great distance from that place. The saint appeared to Constantine, and angrily looking upon him, obtained from the terrified emperor their deliverance. Having, contrary to the edict of Diocletian and Maximian, preached in Myra the truth of the Christian faith, he was taken up by the servants of the two emperors. He was taken off to a great distance and thrown into a prison, where he remained until Constantine, having become emperor, ordered his rescue, and the saint returned to Myra. Shortly afterwards, he repaired to the council which was being held at Nicaea. There he took part with the 318 fathers in condemning the Arian heresy. Scarcely had he returned to his see, than he was taken with the sickness of which he soon died. Looking up to heaven and seeing angels coming to meet him, he began the psalm, In thee, O Lord, have I hoped. And having come to those words, Into thy hands I commend my spirit, his soul took its flight to the heavenly country. His body, having been translated to Bari in Apollia, is the object of universal veneration. Holy Bishop Nicholas, how great is thy glory in God's church! Thou didst confess the name of Jesus before the proconsuls of the world's empire, and suffer persecution for his name's sake. Afterwards thou wast witness to the wonderful workings of God, when he restored peace to his church. And a short time after this again, thou didst open thy lips in the assembly of the 318 fathers to confess with supreme authority the divinity of our Savior Jesus Christ, for whose sake so many millions of martyrs had already shed their blood. Receive the devout felicitations of the Christian people throughout the universe, who trill with joy when they think of thy glorious merits. Help us by thy prayers during these days when we are preparing for the coming of him, who thou didst proclaim to be consubstantial to the Father. Vouchsafe to assist our faith, and to obtain fresh fervor to our love. Thou now beholdest face to face that word by whom all things were made and redeemed. Beseech him to permit our unworthiness to approach him. Be thou our intercessor with him. Thou hast taught us to know him as the sovereign and eternal God. Teach us also to love him as the supreme benefactor of the children of Adam. It was from him, O charitable bishop, that thou didst learn thy tender compassion for the sufferings of thy fellow man, which made all thy miracles to be so many acts of kindness. Cease not, now that thou art in the company of the angels, to have pity on us and succor our miseries. Stir up and increase the faith of mankind in the Savior, whom the Lord has sent them. May this be one of the fruits of thy prayer, that the divine word may be no longer unknown and forgotten in this world, which he has redeemed with his blood. Ask for the pastors of the church that spirit of charity, which shone so brilliantly in thee, that spirit which makes them like their divine master, and wins them the hearts of their people. Remember too, O holy bishop, that church of the East which still loves thee so fervently. When thou wast on this earth, God gave thee power to raise the dead to life. Pray now that the true life which consists in faith and unity may return once more and animate that body which schism has robbed of its soul. By thy supplication, obtain of God that the sacrifice of the Lamb, which is so soon to visit us, may be again and soon celebrated under cupolas of St. Sophia. May the sanctuaries of Kiev and Moscow become re-sanctified by the return of the people to unity. May the pride of the crescent be humbled into submission to the cross, and the majesty of the Tsar be brought to acknowledge the power of the keys of St. Peter, that thus there may be henceforth neither Scythian nor barbarian, but one fold under one shepherd. <laughs>